I recently hosted a live workshop with my friend Jeremiah Lancaster, who is the founding partner with me of the sales coaching business called HuberMethod.com. We did a live workshop. We had over 400 people live in a Zoom room where we discussed sales, how to close, how to gain trust, our six-step method. And it, it was a really great webinar. I hope you enjoy. We're going to play it right here live for you. And if you want to reach out to Jeremiah, go to HuberMethod.com. Thanks for listening. The goal of this webinar, this workshop is to provide as absolute much value as possible um, so that you can become a little bit better at sales. And what we're searching for here is uh, to deliver gold nuggets, okay? So what I want you to do is I want you to have a little pen or you're going to type on a second second screen, or if you're just listening to this, you can you can type it into a, a, a Gmail, email, whatever. I want you to, if you find a gold nugget, which is something that you are going to utilize and implement in your business, I want you to jot it down. And then at the end, we're going to ask you to kind of share those so that we know what we shared struck a chord. We can tweak this thing and get better. Um, but let's do some introductions. My name is Nick Huber. I um, came up selling uh, real estate investment and trying to buy self-storage facilities. Um, I've started since then seven or eight different companies, one of which um, was founded with this guy that I'm right here on this call with uh, called the Huber Method, which is a sales consulting um, and training business. Um, because we've really over the course of these 10 years, we've cracked it. We, we've become really good at sales. It's a system. It's a play that we run over and over again. Um, we're going to pass that on to you all right now on this thing. Number two, we have a QA and a uh, box that's open. Jeremiah are both looking at it right now. You guys can type in questions. We want you to do that. You can type in what you're selling. You can type in um, a problem that you're having when you're on a sales call. You can type in any questions that you have. And we're going to do the last 20 minutes. We're going to rip through as many of those Q&A uh, uh, you know, submissions as we possibly can. But let's just kick this off. And I want to I want to share a little story about my sales journey. I was an entrepreneur since 2011. I started a small business when I was in college. Uh, that business has grown um, and we sold it in 2021. And um, here we are in 2023, uh, you know, doing a real estate private equity company, growing it. But when I was early on in my career, I hated sales. I, I told everybody that I hated sales and I was on a, I was, a, I was getting coffee. I'll never forget. I was with a mentor in upstate New York. I was getting coffee in Ithaca. And I said, I just can't do sales. I can't ask for business. I'm not going to cold call. I can't do any of it. And he said something that struck with me, uh, struck a chord with me. He said, Nick, if you hate sales, you need to go get a job because there is no world where an entrepreneur somebody who's leading people, somebody who's running a company is not doing sales. Your entire day, your entire life is sales. And if you don't embrace it, and if you don't own up to it, and if you don't master it, you will never make real money in this world. Because every part of life is sales. Whether you're trying to attract an employee to come to work for you, you're trying to obviously get a client to pay you money for your services. But there are tons of stuff that uh, I, they said I'm lagging. Damn. Can you hear me, Jeremiah, or not? Yeah, I can hear you. You're lagging a little bit, though, guy. Let me switch my camera just to make it a little bit faster. All right. Worst picture, but it'll work. There you go. All right. So, um, yeah. So, um, I basically had a, had a choice. I, I could either embrace sales and get good at sales, or I could just kind of give up and go get a job for somebody else where some other person was going out and finding um, customers, employees, partners, everything that's needed to grow a company. So I chose option A and I embraced it and I got better at it and I practiced it. So if you're sitting in your office right now telling yourself that you suck at sales, um, it, it can be reversed, A, and you're never going to make real money if you have that attitude. So you might as well embrace it and get good at it. Now, the guy I'm with, Jeremiah Lancaster, um, spent 10 years in sales consulting done sales reorgs at Uber, um, sales training consulting for a long time, a ton of experience. Um, Jeremiah, introduce yourself and then we're, we'll dive right in and um, deliver as much value as, as we possibly can. Great. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, my name is Jeremiah Lancaster. As Nick mentioned, I've spent the last 10 years in, in sales and business development, uh, the last five years professionally in, in building and, and coaching sales teams. Um, you know, very similar to, to Nick, I knew 
you know, a number of years ago, um, I got tapped by by an individual to uh, get more involved in in the process and, and really help close a deal. Um, you know, this mentor told me that I don't need to ask for permission um, if I want to go uh, bring opportunities into the business. Um, and that really kind of opened my eyes that uh, the possibility of, of finding, closing and, and owning business was was something very real for me. So um, I took that opportunity to, to go out and uh, and find uh, an, an opportunity, brought it in without permission to, to go and close it uh, and did my best to do it. But what I learned over time is that um, as I um, as I sold, uh, it's like any other skill that you want to get great at, whether you know you're learning to hit a golf ball for the first time or uh, you're perfecting your uh, your swim prep your your swim uh, you know kind of stroke. You need to be able to practice over and over again. So today uh, we're really excited to to share maybe some of the things that that we've learned along the way to to help you avoid some of the gotchas. Um, I think Nick, one of the things that that really stood out to me was some of the ways that you've raised capital over time. Um, and I think that that journey that you had of, of raising capital is, is something that probably resonates with a lot of people here. Can you help me understand, like, what was that like, you know, raising, raising capital for your first deal? Yeah, so um, it was the classic sales experience. I was reaching out to um, everybody in my network who had any money at all, or I thought they had any money at all. And I was going kitchen table to kitchen table and sitting down trying to get these people to raise capital. And I learned pretty quickly that when it comes to selling high ticket items and anything in general in today's world, um, it's it, the old school pushy sales techniques did not work for me. I would spend, um, if we had a 45 minute meeting scheduled, I would spend 35 minutes talking about all the good things. And, and we were raising money for self-storage deals. We were trying to get people to invest as passive um, investors into self-storage deals. I'd spend the first 30, 45 minutes of these calls talking about all of the good things, you know, why they should invest in storage, why it's such a good asset class, um, why we're such good operators. And it just didn't resonate. And I've kind of developed a, a, a total mindset, sh a mindset shift when it comes to um, selling. And it's kind of more nowadays about, you know, showing these folks that are, that are in front of me that I mean business and that I can be trusted. And you don't do that by telling them how a real estate deal is going to be a home run and how it's going to be risk-free and how it's going to be perfect and why we're the best in the world at what we do. You do it by showing people that you're you know, thinking about some of these harder things. So um, I kind of started to shift these capital raising calls to, hey, look, the real estate market is really um, risky you know, because we're tied to interest rates. We can't control interest rates. Um, we don't know the housing velocity uh, when people are buying and selling homes. That's a huge driver of who rents units. There's things in this market that we can't control. This is what we're worried about. This five-year deal horizon that we've outlaid here, it could turn into a 10-year deal where you're stuck with us. We could underperform if interest rates go up and we got to pay more for our debt service. And I realized that as I talked about the negatives, what makes this stuff hard and what I'm worried about, people were trusting. Like they could... Uh, they could look at me and say, wow, this guy's worried about the things that he should be worried about. And I'm going to, you know, trust him with my, with my capital. A lot of these people were in wealth preservation mode instead of wealth building mode. We can talk about kind of figuring out what matters to individual people, but yeah, it was a, it was a simple shift of stop, stop doing the old school, um, pushy sales techniques and start just showing people that I'm worried about the stuff that I should be worried about and why I can be trusted and how, you know, and it turns out that trust is the number one thing that people care about when they're investing capital in real estate. So it was, a, it was a big learning lesson for me. So yeah, I spent two years at, you know, a hundred plus kitchen tables and raised very little cash. And now you fast forward to today, we, you know, the, the word got out who, who we knew increased and, and I switched my tactics and we've raised 40 plus million dollars and bought over a hundred million dollars worth of real estate. It, it seems so counterintuitive to, to tell people, you know, maybe all the negatives. Why do you think that works so well? Um, why do you think that builds so much trust with people? I think they, uh, they're just used to being sold. Like every, every part of every day, we are told why we should buy something and all the benefits that are going to come when we buy something. They're just not used to it. They're caught off guard when you really outline and lay out the negative. So let's, let's uh, pop right into this slideshow. We're not going to, we're not going to do this the entire time, but I'm going to share my screen. Um, right now and kind of talk about our methodology so that people can have a breakdown of exactly kind of uh, how we think about this stuff. 
And it's really a six step um, system that when you're going into a sales interaction, this is how you're going to structure it. And this is how you're going to think about it. Um, number one, and, and let's, let's elaborate on each of these things, Jeremiah, because they're so yeah. important. Number one is you have to operate from a point of leverage. I was going into these calls with uh, a mindset of desperation. Like I have to have this capital. Like in a, at the end of the call, I was like, will you invest? Like, let's, let's get this going. I need it. We can't raise the rest of the capital. And they kind of knew that I needed them more than they needed me. And they just, there was just no sense of urgency. There was no, you know, uh, re reverse leverage at all in this deal. So I had to go out and, and change my mindset of operating from point of leverage. Every sale that I get on, and now in any environment that I'm in, I don't necessarily need to make this sale. My business is going to be just fine. I'm going to be okay. And that mindset shift alone made it so that kind of people want what they can't have and, and you know, almost wanted to work with me even more. And I think this just kind of speaks to human nature. Like people love to buy, but they hate being sold to. That moment that you get that uh, inbound call, uh, you're expecting it to be, you know, your car warranty or, you know, some other thing like that. Um, and you're immediately turned off. Your mind goes into to kind of, you know, uh, this is a sales push. Uh, I'm not going to have this conversation. But whenever you operate from that point of leverage and know that like this one sale is not going to ruin my entire quarter, it's not going to ruin my entire business, uh, that really sets you up to, to be in a position of power. And I think that also sets you up in a position of respect. People want to work with people that they respect. They don't want to work with people that feel desperate that they need their business to, to actually run it the next day. So I think it's a super critical that even if you don't, um, you know, even if you're, even if this sale is super critical, if you act like it, uh, you will not win the deal. Yeah. So every call I got on, it was five minutes before the Zoom call. I had done my discovery, which we're going to talk about. I just told myself, Nick, you don't need this sale. If this person doesn't invest or this seller doesn't sell you their storage facility or this employee doesn't come to work for you, life will go on. You're going to be just fine. And that mindset shift before the call, boom, going into it was step number one. Now, as soon as I'm on the call, now we're on the sales call. I have five minutes or less on an investor call to show that I'm an expert and show that I can, you know, and, and to tell people what I've done. Most people are very afraid to brag on themselves. They'll tell their life story. They'll talk about the personal things, but they will not brag on the size of their business and the size of their team and what they're doing. And so many people, when they're buying, all they want is reputation and who you're working with, how big your company is, is so important. The perfect example of this is when I'm, uh, I spent the second half of, you know, every week cold calling self-storage owners. I was literally on the phone trying to get owners to sell to me. So I was in a, in a selling environment. I was selling myself and my company to try to get these owners to answer the call and actually sell their storage facility to me. And I had eight seconds on the phone to prove that I'm worth talking to and that I should be trusted or at least um, you know not hung up on. So I had eight seconds to say, hey, this is Nick Huber. I own 63 self-storage facilities. We manage 1.9 million square feet. I know you have a property right here in Shippenville, PA. I just wanted to let you know that I own a property in the county over in Clarion, PA, and we're buying aggressively. We're paying top dollar. I'd love to give you an offer for your property. Boom. Instantly, right now, they know that I'm a big deal. I didn't necessarily brag on myself. I didn't you know, lie. I didn't do anything different. I just, boom, instantly showed that I have credibility. And that was huge. Yeah, and I think like I, to your point about people not wanting to brag about themselves, I do think that this is a common challenge that most people uh, you know, have, a, have an issue with whenever they call people. People want to know why you're calling. They also want to know what's in it for me. And if they're not talking to someone that's qualified or even has the, the ability to actually purchase that property, they're not going to want to have the conversation. And I think that if you're not able to do that in a very short amount of time, you're going to lose interest and you're going to start to see people fall away from you. So I think it's really critical that you land that pitch on what you're doing and why, that you establish that credibility up front. If you don't, uh, if you don't prove that you're an expert, you're, the likelihood that you're going to close that call is, is close to none. Yeah. And I think this can be applied across any industry. Yeah. Um, we own a, a, a performance marketing agency called Ad Rhino, where we're, you know, we're doing pay-per-click marketing. And at the very beginning, the first two minutes of the call, it is on the script that we say, hey, I am Nick. I work at Ad Rhino. We manage over $200,000 a month of ad spend. We've done this many, you know, Google Analytics for conversions. We've seen, you know, uh, we've worked with companies like X, Y, and Z, and this is why we can be trusted. That is instantly laying the laying the groundwork of why should I trust these people? 
Are they legitimate? So that's step two. Number three. So we told them why we can be trusted and who we are. Now, this is what is going to go against every old school sales tactic that you've ever seen or heard of. And you're going to talk about the negatives. Just like I discussed on my calls with um, you know, investors, you're going to talk about the negatives with the person who's on the call with you and talk about what makes it hard, what scares you, why there might be delays, why there might be scheduling problems. I have a great, uh, I have two friends in town and this is a, you know, it kind of a, it turns into a parable over time, but I have two guys in town play golf with both of them and they both run general contracting companies and they both sell houses or like build houses. So they're selling services to build somebody a custom home. There's two sales tactics that happen. Number one, this guy is over promising on the schedule. He's over promising on how the house will look. He's over promising on the price. He's talking about how amazing the home will look. He's talking about all the things he can do. And he's setting himself up for, okay, yeah, wow, that sounded amazing. But A, he's setting himself up for a ton of stress when it comes time to deliver. But person number two, my other buddy, goes into these sales calls and say, look, um, I can promise you that I'm going to treat this entire pro process with integrity. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z to control costs because that's a huge problem in our business is the cost overruns. We have change orders. I know you're going to have some change orders. This is how things happen, but this stuff is hard. We can't control the weather. We can't control these four other suppliers that we have. I have contractors that have other jobs. I promise you that I'm, I'm going to lose sleep over your schedule. I'm worried about it. We might not come in on time. I'll tell you that right now. We might not come in on budget. I'll tell you that right now. But this is why it's hard and this is what I'm worried about. And this is why, you know, you can trust me because I'm thinking about these things and I'm worried about them. You would be on you would be amazed at how often friend number two closes deals and makes more money. And friend number one closes the deals on the needy customers. The customers have unreasonable expectations and delivery, his entire business starts to suffer from there. So when you flip this, you know, you flip the uh trajectory of the call from, hey, this is why everything's amazing to, hey, this is what you need to worry about. Your world really opens up and you really gain trust with people. It's an unbelievable thing. Yeah. And I think you start to disarm people, right? Like I think, uh, you know, your second friend is starting to disarm people and let them know that things can go wrong. I think in, in my experience, every time that I've tried to pitch a product um, and pitch all the benefits of that product without truly uh, sharing with them, here's the things that went wrong the last five times that we did this. This is the things that you need to watch out for during your implementation adds more credibility. And going back to that, that point about buying from people, you know, buying from people that you trust, uh, people trust people that recognize that they have made mistakes before, um, that the, it hasn't gone perfect. Um, if you're telling mm -hmm. someone, that every time that you do something, it goes perfect. Immediately, people are going to say, hold on, time out. I've never done anything. <laughs> Am I right? getting scammed? Am I getting time. scammed right now? Exactly. So it feels like a scam. So if you start to tell people in this point here, right, tell them about the negatives, what makes it hard. These are the things that keep me up at night. It'll start to establish a lot of credibility uh, and makes that makes that positioning a lot easier. What's we have a really good we have a really good question here. And this is this is the chicken before the egg thing and the hardest part about sales because Number one is, hey, look, Nick, I don't own 63 self-storage facilities. I don't own a property in the county over. I don't have 1.9 million square feet. Or the other guy says, I haven't built 30 homes or you know, I haven't you know, raised $40 million of capital. How do you do it in the early days? And how do you operate from a point of leverage if you really do need a sale? You need it really bad. What I want you to realize if you're watching that is that it, watching this is that the Huber method, these six steps, this is the goal. This is the goal of a sales interaction. We are working towards this. And this is why the flywheel of business is so powerful. Okay. Because as you get more customers, you can operate from a higher point of leverage. You don't need any one of them, you know, that big a deal. If you're start just starting out, you're actually not an expert. You have to think of ways that you can get really creative to talk about things. And what I would do in some of these very early calls, when we hadn't bought a second storage facility or a third storage facility, I'd say we run a big moving company in the area, which in reality, we just operated at a student storage, you know, uh, operation in Pittsburgh. And we're two hours outside of that. I'd say, you know, we run a moving company in the area. We're very well capitalized. I have some institutional investors, which I did technically have the email addresses of some institutional investors. I'd be like, I do, you know, and this is why we are going to pay, pay top dollar for your self-storage facility. Right. And it just gets easier with time, but there is no great way to, you know, show people that you're a expert when you're not, you have to just get creative and 
speak with confidence and confidence is so much of this stuff. I think it also applies for like whenever you're starting a new business, right? I think we were recently, I was recently coaching someone who made a big transition from being a C-level executive at a company wants to operate their own business. And we're seeing more of this happen every day where people just want to kind of put themselves on the driver's seat. Um, and he asked me, hey, how do I, I've never done this before, but I know I can, I, I know I can do this well. Uh, and him and I had a really deep conversation that his expertise and, and his credibility from before can be transferred to, to some of the experiences too. So to your point, Nick, um, we don't want to lie about, about what we've done, but we also want to make sure that all the experiences that led up to this uh, have given you the confidence to be able to go do that. So if it's your first 10 customers and you're just starting out, take an opportunity to catalog all the reasons why uh, that people should work with you and then all the reasons what uh, that could go wrong. Yeah. And, and look, charisma and willpower can get you a long way. I've, I've, you know, we're, we're starting a business brokerage right now and people we're, we're talking to folks who are, are thinking about selling a company that they've owned for 20, 30 years. And they're going to pick a broker that's going to guide them through this process and help them get the best price so that they can retire and go to Florida. Who are they going to trust? The company in their town who sold 50 businesses and has that experience? Or are they going to trust NickHuber.com who has literally sold zero companies? I got on a, I got on a sales call. My, my dad's run that business with me. And he's like, Nick, I need you to get on here and close this deal for me. Like, get on here and close it. It's this big manufacturing company out in Colorado. I get on the call and I'm like, look, man, I'll be honest with you. We are not the most highly qualified business to sell you. Like we, we don't have experience. We haven't transacted a lot of business, but look, let me tell you something that we will do. This other competitor that you're thinking about going to market with, they've got 600 stale leads on their email list. They're going to put some, you know, 27 year old uh, intern or analyst on your project. Um, when you list with us, you're going to have Tim, Tom, and Nick, and we're going to work our butts off. We're going to cold call the strategic buyers. And guess what? We have distribution. I have 240,000 people on my email list. I, have, I can create this buzz on Twitter. And that's why we are going to get you a higher price than a competitor. We lost the deal. Okay. But, but <laughs> we will win some deals. We will get some momentum going and things like that will start to happen. But look, you got to just grind in the early days. There's no perfect way to outline this. I think you, you're still, right. you can still do these things. You just got to grind it out. And I think that the things that you just talked about are completely free. We're going to outwork everyone else. You've got these people on your team. Here are the things that we plan on doing for you. And this is why you should work with us. I think that's super critical. Let's go on to like qualify the person. What yep. do you so mean we've, we've op we're operating from a point of leverage. At least we have the mindset that we don't need the deal. We're, we're showing it early on in this call or this meeting that we're an expert. And then we're starting to talk about the negatives. We've started to show that we are worried about the things that we should be worried about so that they can start to trust us. And now we're going to qualify the person. And this is what totally gets the, catches them off guard. We are literally going to make sure that they would be a good customer to work with. We're going to start interviewing them almost. When I was on investor calls, I'd be like, what really motivates you as an investor? Like, who do you look for in, in an LP? Like, how do you think about long-term compounding of capital? Do you want to sell this deal at year five or do you want to hold it and get the cash flow from it for a long time? And what I start to do is I start to realize if I actually want to make the sale, it turns out, Jeremiah, that there's a lot of sales throughout the years that I won that I wished I didn't win because they were not a good fit. They didn't have the right attitude. They expected too much of me and they were complete nightmares to work with. We can talk about leverage and my asshole rule in a minute. But basically what I do is kind of micro interview them and different fields. You do different levels of this stuff, but I'm going to qualify the person to make sure that they're a good client. And then I'm going to flip the seats again. I'm going to flip seats again and I'm going to ask them the question, Jeremiah, like I just told you all the reasons why you should not invest in self-storage. Like I'm, I told you where interest rates might go up. I told you all the things that might go wrong. Why did you get on this call? Like what, what do you like about self-storage and what do you like about me? And when I did that in investor calls, when I did that in, in investor calls, something unbelievable happened. I shut up. I was shut my mouth and the person would sell themselves. They would talk for five minutes about all the things they love about storage. Okay. They would talk about all the reasons why they don't need the capital, how they're playing a long-term game. And if there's a downturn and we hold on to the property, that's all fine. They'd be completely understanding. By the end of the call, they had talked themselves into investing with me. It was a beautiful, beautiful thing. Same thing with storage owners. Okay. I would say, look, you know, interest rates are really high right now. Maybe now is not the best time to sell. Have you thought about it? You know, if you hold this thing and I would start to coach, I would literally start adding so much value to the sales call. And that's a piece here. While you're qualifying and letting them sell themselves, you start to add value to them. 
give them free advice. Talk to them about what you would do once you you know own the property. Like, hey, I'm going to own your property, but I think you're undercharging in rents. If you really want to maximize the amount of money that you could sell this building for, you should raise rents at least 10 or $15 per unit and come back to me in six months. I might be able to pay you a couple hundred thousand dollars more for your property. Okay. Boom. They're starting to get value out of that. And it's even building even more trust. Um, Anil at Ad Rhino, he'll get on there and say, yeah, I think selling, look, I think, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think like letting people, I think what, what you touched on is super critical that people often do is that they over pitch or they oversell. After you've done this kind of like, you know, positioning of, of really starting to qualify the person, let them start to tell you all the reasons why they need this. You know, if there's some level of mutual interest, someone's going to want to have a conversation about this. And it's important for us to just like kind of sit back. A lot of the, uh, most of the deals that I've lost, I've oversold. Um, every time that I take a step back listen to what the person has said and then ask them a really provocative question like why wouldn't you want to you know why wouldn't you want to move forward with this today uh, what's going to prevent you from you know or how are you going to actually accomplish this in the next six months or how are you going to grow revenue by 30 percent you already told me that you have large investor expectations and that you need to meet them before the end of the year or you're not going to be able to go out and raise additional funding those kind of questions really start to put people on their heels. And then that's when they can start to sell themselves on these solutions. Then they can start to build the internal consensus that's necessary to start making the, you know, to start making the, the sale a, a complete kind of thought for them. Before that, you are now in pitch mode, which is always going to put you away from that position of leverage. Uh, and it's going to make you feel like um, you're constantly pushing uphill rather than like this concept of like downhill selling that moment right there, kind of like in the sales process is really where the ball starts to roll downhill. And it starts to become something that like, now you're catching the momentum of you and that person moving downhill in the, in the right way together. And then that's when you're going to start to act fast. We have a really good question from uh, Michael here. He said in the early days, uh, you know, when you don't have the reputation, you don't have the expert experience is your, um, your leverage is pricing. Should you take advantage of that or should you raise your pricing? There is, look, there's nothing wrong with doing work submarket to, to actually learn, to actually get better so that you can add value. But let me tell you something. As you raise your prices, and we've seen this at my web development agency, Web Run, we've taken our full web, web rebuild prices from you know $6,000 to $12,000. As you raise your prices, the quality of the customer drastically increases and they're way less of a pain in the ass. And you can actually afford to hire good people and build a business. So many people are selling and they're undercutting. They're trying to compete on price. In my opinion, there are three areas that you can compete. When you're making a sale, there's three areas that you can compete. Price is number one. You're going to be cheaper than everybody else. Number two is speed. You're going to be faster than everybody else. And number three is quality. You're going to be better than everybody else. Okay. Too many owners at the very beginning are competing on price only. Hey, I'm going to be, I'm going to, maybe I'm going to compete on all three. And let me tell you what, you can't compete on all three because you can't afford to pay great people when you're doing quick work at high quality, trying to do it at high quality, and you're not charging a high enough price. You got to choose which of those three things you're going to compete on when you are setting up a sale. And I always recommend competing on quality. Hey, look, we do work for the best of the best. You might not be a good fit. Or hey, we're going to turn this around faster than anybody else is going to turn this around. You know, there's big money involved in that stuff too. Another question. Do you think your method can be applied to companies that sell products that are commodities? And the answer to that is absolutely yes, because you don't... In, in my opinion, not every person that you're selling is a client, okay? You're selling vendors. You're selling the people who supply you. Why should I sell this widget to Nick at a great price? How fast can I get it there? You're, you're, sell, you're competing on speed. There are many other things that you're selling throughout this, you know, in, in, the, in the economic environment when you're selling a commodity. And that means it's not necessarily in price. Yes, you're competing on price there, but you've got to really sell your vendors to sell to you. You got to sell your employees to work for you. You're selling other areas to get to, to gain your alpha. So I think, hope that I, think helps. That, I think it actually even helps more with commoditized products, right? Because if you start to think about any kind of commodity, if quality is roughly the same, then back to those kind of like three points, you're going to have to be slightly competitive on, on pricing here. Um, but you also have to be better at the, the quality of delivery. Um, and I think that that's something that, you know, far too many people just kind of like gloss over is like, what, how are we going to deliver this to you? And how are we actually going to provide value in, in terms of this product? If you do that well, and if you are able to articulate it very clearly about how or why our process works better than everyone else, even though you might be getting similar services, like 
similar Google PPC, uh, ad management, could be a cost segregation study, whatever that thing may be. Uh, you're going get, to get the same quality of, of, of product there, but we're going to deliver in a way that's unique to you and that we're going to care about in a way that's that's much better than every one of our competitors. I love it. Now, quick promo. I'm only, I'm only going to sell you guys for about 20 seconds here, but if you go to hubermethod.com, you can set up a free consulting call with this guy right here. He won't pressure you to buy a coaching plan. He won't hard sell, but he will absolutely look into your business and tell you ways that you can, can become a better salesperson. So go to hubermethod.com, set up a free call with Jeremiah right now. Now, let's go back and talk um, about this last piece because this very last bullet here, Jeremiah, is uncomfortable. And so many people, just they just mess it up. And you have an example of a call that you were doing a coaching call with our engineering team that I own part of. And we had the opportunity to ask for the business. We had the opportunity to close it and we just didn't do it. So tell me what, tell me what you learned there. Yeah, far too often we we don't ask for the business. We assume that the <laughs> product will sell itself. Um, and you know, I think that thinking about a commodity or any kind of product, like it is important to ask people, are you ready to move forward? How do we get you set up today? Especially if someone has already told you explicitly. Um, we were running a coaching call, we were listening to this call. There was a lot of rapport built. Uh, we compared and contrasted pricing versus another competitor. This guy is literally holding up pieces of paper with competitor logos on the call as we're reviewing this. It's saying, these people do this, you guys do this. Here's the other price quote here. 15 minutes into the call, the customer the customer looks and says, you know what? I think you know, you're a couple dollars cheaper, but you know I really like the way this conversation's going. Uh, I wanna move forward with you, even though I've already done this with them four times. And instead of saying, great, let's get you started right now. Okay, let's pull up the relevant information necessary. He asked another question after he already said, I'm ready to move forward. He said, maybe I should wait a week. What do you think? And <laughs> out of being polite, uh, this gentleman said, you know what? You could wait a week if you wanted to, uh, but you know, uh, you know, we could, we, we could move forward today. And he said, is there any, is there any problem waiting a week? No problem at all. Now, the oh story gosh. here uh, is that he did come back. He was a man of his word, came back in a week from then, and the, and the sale uh, eventually closed. So uh, just to kind of finish out this thought uh, and kind of think about the uh, the kind of the Huber method here, again, operate from a point of leverage is step one. We always want to operate from this point of leverage or act like you do. Feel that you're an expert. Uh, you are a big deal. We want to talk about the negatives, all the things that, that prevent you from, from actually making this deal happen. Uh, we want to qualify that person. Again, this is where we can start to learn about them, ensure that we have the right kind of customers here. Uh, let them sell themselves. So ask them that provoking question, right? Be provocative about it. So based on uh, you know everything that you heard today, interest rates are through the roof, right? Per square foot rents are, are down across the market today. Why do you still want to invest in self-storage? Well, I have capital. I, I believe in the asset class. I feel, you know, I, I love all the benefits and appreciation all these great things that they're going to sell themselves on. And then last but not least, ask for the business. If you don't ask for the deal, it's not just going to come into your lap. Uh, if you build a product that does that, you probably don't need our help. Uh, but if you if you sell any other product, you're going to need to ask for the business. I love it. Now, um, we have some good questions coming in here, but if you're listening, uh, go over to the Q&A section and type in a question. Tell us what you're selling. Tell us what you're working on. Tell us a question that you have about sales. Jeremiah, let's try to uh, deliver as much value as we possibly can um, uh, with these nuts and bolts. And, and I think a, a couple things really stand out here. Speed wins deals. It's obvious to, when, when you hear me say that, but look, if you wait um, 20 hours after you get a lead, it is, you're going to close it, you know, 20% less or 30% less or 50% less, depending on your, your industry than if you get on a call that day while they're excited. Okay. Timing is everything. That's another important part. There's motivated sellers and they're motivated for a very short window in time. When I'm in this market to buy something, I'm in that market, I'm very motivated for three days. <laughs> and then I've made it. The purchase decision has been made. I've bought it. You have to catch the person at the right time. So what that means is continue to follow up. Professionally follow up a lot, okay? Just because somebody ignores an email doesn't mean you need to A, say, oh, I'm, you know, I've sent you a bunch of emails. I wonder how you get back to me. No, it's just reminding them, hey, I'm here. You need me. I need you. Let me know if we can do business together. See if our circles overlap. You tell me. You're going to follow up because if an important person ignores your email or they ignore your DM or they ignore your text message, it's because they're not in the market right then. It doesn't mean they're not going to be later. I've called. I've, I've cold called on the phone and have a, had a conversation with a storage owner in Newfield, New York. 
I talked to her for two years, talked to her every quarter for two years. And I was like, man, I'm going to stop calling this lady. I'm done with this. This is just taking up way too much of my brain space. Boom. 24 months in, two years in, call number eight. She said, oh, you know what, Nick? I'm ready. Come see me. And we made a deal the next day and we bought her storage facility. And it's been a great deal for us. I think timing is one of those things that you can't perfect, but if you are not in market and if you are not following up with people, you will never time it well. You need to get more at bats than, than you can ever imagine. I had a prospect that I wanted to do business with really bad. He worked at a really cool company and I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to, to train their entire sales team. Um, I sent them a proposal. He ignored it blindly, just completely ignored it. Went totally ghost mode on me for three months. What I found out was like, he was leaving that company um, and he didn't want to tell me that, that he was leaving that company. I followed up into the abyss for like, uh, again, another three months or so. Eventually he left, but he <laughs> went to another company and he said, Hey, Jeremiah, he came back about six months later and said, Hey, Jeremiah, I won't forget how frequently that you sent me messages, even though I was a ghost, I was dealing with some things internally and I want to bring you into this organization. I have a budget now. I want to allocate it. I want to spend money with you because he knew that I was going to cons uh, consistently follow up with them, but I was also going to deliver value. I think another thing too, Nick, like whenever you think about speed wins deals, um, I heard an interesting stat that 78% of customers will buy from the first business that responds to their lead. They just want people that pick up the phone. Uh, they want people that answer and respond back to them. Don't wait three, five, six, seven days to get back to someone. The business comes in, schedule the appointment, get on the call, act faster. Even if you don't have all of your materials done the right way, even if you haven't beautifully researched everything, even if your deck doesn't look as polished, Acting with speed will actually help you win more deals than acting more slowly and trying to perfect everything that you're doing. I think also when you're following up, you can add little tidbits of value. Um, what one of our sales guys does beautifully at the SEO agency, Bold SEO, it's a link building firm. He'll follow up to a lead where he had a conversation a month ago and say, hey, I'm just checking back in. I, and here's something that I learned. Like here's your domain authority and here's your competitor's domain authority. Um, and also here's a link that you could pot potentially build yourself. You don't need us. Reach out to this person, get this link. It will help you. It will help you uh, list better. And it's like, wow, okay, this person did a lot of work for no, for, for no, they're adding value to me and expecting nothing in return. I think that's a beautiful thing. Now let's talk very briefly about uh, discovery and how many sales reps don't do any research at all before they get on a call, get on a call. So yeah, many, I think like, so, they messed so it up. Many. They show up blindly to, to a conversation. I think like we live in the world of like instant information. Uh, we have tools at our fingertips that will tell you everything about someone in literally seconds. Um, and you're able to just quickly type their email into, into Google. You're able to find out information from them. So showing up to a call without any context on who they are, what their business does, or even where they're located uh, is, is going to start losing losing points for you immediately here. So discovery starts the second that the lead comes in. You want to augment that lead with as much information as possible. Do they have a LinkedIn profile? Where are they based? What does their business do? How many employees do they have? Start to create a thesis or a thought around why is this business inquiring with me? What could I potentially do for them? And maybe even have two or three ideas to present before you even get on the call. As soon yep. as you start having that first conversation, a lot of people assume that like discovery is like, a stage inside of their CRM or their Airtable, when really it's this continuous process that happens through every interaction. So the clues that they leave you in their email, the form on their inquiry form, uh, the conversation that you have with them, every single touch point that you have is an opportunity to learn a little bit more. And I think like people have to be naturally curious. And if you don't care, or if you're not curious about how that person's business ticks, and maybe you don't work in landscaping, maybe you don't work in, uh, you know, maybe you don't work in that industry, but you should start to understand how many mowers do you have out there today? How many clients do you have? And once you start to understand more and more about their business, it becomes a process where you're actually able to help solve that challenge for them, rather than simply saying, hey, you should buy this thing because you inquired. Uh, that's not how business gets done. So always, have an opportunity to be curious, ask questions about them, start from the moment the inquiry comes in to the moment that that person closes. These are discovery opportunities. Yeah. And, and so we have two questions about cold leads, either cold calling or cold outbound. And let me just tell you that it is a confidence game and it is a numbers game. Okay. Do not get upset if, and this person says cold LinkedIn messages is his best way to send mess, get clients. Okay. Send 2000 cold LinkedIn messages to get a client if you have to. Okay. Another person works in a 
a private jet uh, brokerage company. He's like, sometimes I feel annoying because I just keep following up. I just keep following up. That's another thing where it's a timing thing. Somebody needs to get somewhere. And if you are top of mind, when that happens, you will get a loyal client. It's a numbers game. Michael Jordan missed 27 game winning shots. If you get emotionally tied to winning every sale, and if you get personally offended and emotional about losing business, you will not make it in this world. You turn on the game face, you you play the numbers, and you do what you need to do to hit the numbers that know that you're going to hit the metrics that you're going to hit. So yes, absolutely. All this stuff applies to cold outreach and, and basically not warm leads. Now let's talk about owner sales versus hired sales. A lot of people here trying to build a sales team. I want to talk in just a second about how you should train and coach your own sales team and how important that is. But let's talk about owner sales versus hired sales. Jeremiah, a hired salesperson and an owner, what, what's the difference in their closing percentages and how effective they can be? I call it the halo effect. Every owner can sell their business better than any other person there. And they're usually like a magnet for the best kind of business. And if you've ever worked with like a really kind of like gregarious or kind of like, you know, really fantastic kind of business owner, they're always connecting the business with more and more clients and more and more people. And the reason why is that you have to be the most passionate person. No one cares more than you as the business owner about the product, how it's structured, the people that are inside of the business, the way that you're going to get it. And that if you start to, if you start to hire sales teams too early, what happens is that you're going to watch this like really stark drop off and close and close rates happening. And if you can't close business yourself, you should not hire a sales rep to help solve that problem for you. Even if sales is not your background, even if you don't consider yourself great at sales, you have to learn how to speak to customers and meet them where they are to solve that challenge. If not, you're going to fail. Um, and I see this happen way too often. Business owners say, Hey, I've got three people here. I'm focused on operations. I'm focused on delivery. Um, I should not be selling. And that's the exact wrong thing that you should do. You should lean yep. into selling. The more frequently that you speak to prospects and customers, the better you'll have a, a you'll, the better a, a, of a chance that you'll have in closing that business, but also understanding what you should do with your product next and then how you should actually address, um, you know, what, what you're selling. Let's, uh, I'm, I'm going to lay out a framework here that's, I think is so critical because I'm very passionate about this. I think a outside salesperson should not be on your radar until you're 10 plus employees and at least $5 million of revenue. I think the owner of the business, the entrepreneur, the person who's running the show in the early days, they should spend half their time delivering the product or service and half the time on sales. Okay. And that half the time on sales stays that half the time on sales stays. And the other half of the time starts to shift between hiring and training employees and delivering the service until when you're at about five to 10 employees and two to 3 million a year of revenue, you're literally spending 100% of your time, half of it on sales, business development, and half of it on managing and hiring and recruiting employees. Okay. Then, then, and only then when the sales is coming in too fast for you to recruit and hire, that's when you hire an outside sales rep. I've seen it 20 times and maybe one or two of the of my buddies in network have been able to hire an outside salesperson very early on in their company. We tried doing it at several of our businesses and it just doesn't work. When you have a new business, when you have a new service and you get an outside salesperson in, there are several problems with it. Number one, the commission structure is going to be a mess because you don't know how they're going to be able to sell. Number two, the salespeople are the most expensive people in the workforce. So to hire a good salesperson, it's going to set you back a ton. Number three, they don't own your know your business like you know your business. And it just gets dirty when you're selling something where the processes and the systems for delivery are not clear. Okay. Unless you're a big, well-oiled machine and, you're, and your company has systems and processes, it's very hard for somebody who doesn't understand delivery. They're not involved in delivering the website, delivering the SEO, whatever it is. It's very hard for them to be an effective salesperson. Okay. Somebody said, um, what would you do to get decision makers to meet with you faster? And look, again, numbers game. This is a numbers game and you're going to try to add value. You're going to try to add as much value as possible. And you're going to try to prove that you're an expert. Another question, is your eight second script basically the same for phone, email, DM? What about your other companies? And look, yes, I have an eight second script at every single company. The eight second script at Ad Rhino is, hey, we manage $200,000 a month of pay-per-click ads. We are reliable and trustworthy. For Bolt Storage, we have 1.9 million square feet and we bought a property in the town next door. That's why you should sell your buildings to us. Um, the engineering agency, we've done a thousand cost segs this year. We're 30% cheaper than the comp competitors. And we've done everything from a 
100K duplex to a $100 million industrial portfolio. That's the paragraph in the cold email. And that's the line on the phone when you're doing sales. So yes, the eight second rule is prove that you're an expert and prove that you can be trusted and prove that you're a big deal in the first eight seconds of a call or the first paragraph of the email. Works every time. See another another great question here um, about following up and not feeling annoying or you know using other channels to to kind of consistently follow up. Um, the one thing that that we often uh, you know forget about is that not everyone likes to respond to email. They may like a text, they may like a LinkedIn message, they may see something on Twitter. Um, there's other channels that people can use, and by using them effectively, you're going to meet people where they are. Um, and oftentimes, people don't they don't fail to respond to you because like they're not interested that day, it might just not be the right time. And understanding that if you consistently repeat that message over and over again, add value, you got to give, 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 and then you can eventually ask for that get. And whenever you ask for that get, make sure you do it the right way, but you got to give enough first. Um, and if you don't give enough first, people are not going to respond back to you. Let's talk about um, coaching your people. Let's say that you do have a sales team. And I do now. At Bolt Storage, we have three full-time acquisitions folks cold calling, and I coach them. Now, Jeremiah coaches them. And in the Huber Method company in general coaches the people at my individual companies to do this stuff. But I want to tell you a story about a company called Movement Mortgage. If you've ever heard of this business, they um, they, they do home loans, okay? They got the red M and they hire folks fresh out of college or literally they take Starbucks, Starbucks baristas and develop them into mortgage home mortgage loan officers. Okay. They go into a town and one of their keys is that they have an amazing coaching program from within, meaning every loan officer, they have an accountability coach and they have a call and meeting, you know, breakdown coach. And I was talking to a buddy. He's, he, he was a great friend of mine here in Athens. He was running the branch for a really long time. And he grew it to one of the biggest portfolios in Athens. And the company in general over the last 10 years has just exploded. And it's all on the back of this program where they have every loan officer has a coach. And that coach gets on biweekly meetings with them. They review calls. They hold them accountable. They do follow-up scripts. They help them set goals. A lot of things that you need to be doing with your team. So let's talk about, okay, yes, this is how it works if you work with us but people can utilize this in their own companies when they have salespeople. I call it like the game tape rule, okay? An NFL team or a basketball team, they'll spend hundreds of hours every off season and five to 10 hours a week looking at tape and studying what happened and looking at what they did wrong and what worked and what didn't work. But I talk to people who are sales professionals and I talk to people whose organizations depend on sales and I ask them, have you ever reviewed one of your calls? Like, do you look at your data? Do you set goals? Do you have an accountability partner who holds you accountable to, to make your calls and do your things? The answer is a resounding no. So they're going on, they're trying to make sales to fuel their companies. They're trying to make sales, sales to fuel their business, but they don't actually have a coach or they don't even coach their people on doing these things. So Jeremiah, break us down like what you recommend. Let's, okay, yes, this is what Huber Method does. And you can go to hubermethod.com and you can hire us to do this for you if you're a sole proprietor. But what should you do to your sales team, Jeremiah, to, to make sure that they're performing and that they're doing well? Yeah, I think it all starts with like, you got to start uh, understanding what motivates people, right? Start with their why, start to understand how and why what motivates people. And you do that through through regular conversations about how they're performing. So first, establish that cadence. Um, understand that you need to do this on a consistent basis. The problem that most business owners do is they think coaching is like, something they can do once every quarter, or they'll bring in someone to train their team at the beginning of, you know, beginning of employment, uh, or they'll write a document down. It is a continuous process. Every week, you need to spend time with your team and you need to start to establish that coaching culture up front. Once you do that, once you understand kind of what the why is behind that, you want to set meaningful or, you know, or measurable results, right? People need to lean into what those results are. And you need to hold people accountable for hitting those goals. Now, you may not know the right answer yet. To Nick's point earlier, like if you hire a sales professional, you can say, hey, I close 20 deals every quarter. Each one of those deals is worth $150,000 each. I think that you can do at least 15 in your first quarter and set that benchmark. Hold yep. them accountable to closing five deals every month. If by week two in their first month that they're not pacing towards Three, or three to five deals, you have a problem. And that's where you need to start to get involved pretty early. The second thing is that going out and listening to customer conversations is critical. As a business owner and as a seller, review your own game tape and spend time thinking about what are the things that I could have done better on this conversation to help get that person to move forward a little bit faster. 
sometimes it's like very Give simple. A, like you, you have a couple stories that you can tell of like very tactical examples. And and let's talk about um, bold SEO first. We have a we have a young guy who is an absolute killer. Like he's super switched on and he's an amazing salesperson. You started working with him about four weeks ago. You started reviewing calls, and I think it was just a simple structure change that like increased his closing percentage by you know ten percent. Yeah, I noticed that every one of his calls kind of started in a, like an unrepeatable way. Uh, it was like talking about training in ultra marathons or talking about weather or what's, you know, what's top of mind here. What we did was we implemented a really simple way and effective call structure for him to go. So we started out with a clean opening, showing appreciation. We always set the amount of time necessary. So I, I saw that we're, we're scheduled till three o'clock Eastern time. Does that still work for you? And then we asked a simple question in the beginning. Um, Something very, you know, innocuous, like uh, whenever we, whenever you inquired, it said that, you know, you had a couple of questions about backlinks. What about backlinking is most interesting to you, right? Um, or, you know, what are you hoping to get out of today's conversation in regards to backlinking? That really set off that conversation. So now we had a discovery process and a meaningful conversation. It didn't feel like I was prying into that person's business. And then at the end, we wanted to always reserve the last five minutes. I always tell salespeople to not be selfish. Uh, they should always give, give, give. The last five minutes of every conversation, and this goes against all sales advice, be selfish. Those last five minutes are used for something really, really important. It's setting next steps. And you want to set your existing, your next step on the call that you have right now, not wait for email. And what I started to realize is that he was setting all of it. He was running all of his calls right up to the clock. And at the end of the conversation, he would actually go and say, okay, I'll just send you a follow-up email. And then guess what happened? three, four, five, six follow-up emails later, no sale was done. Instead, what we did was we set the next conversation on the existing call. This shortened his sales cycle and increased the amount of deals that he was closing because now we had meaningful next steps on the call. And we can even use that time, even if we close the person in between there for our next onboarding call or whatever else needed to happen. So again, simple call structure, show some appreciation up in the beginning, set the expectations up front, and then ask a meaningful question, get selfish in the last five minutes, Ask if there's any meaning, uh, ask if there's any next steps and then set the next conversation on the existing call. Yeah. And and look, if you do this to, to your sales reps, amazing things will happen. We're seeing, we're seeing it already. I mean, tell, tell this story right here, Jeremiah, you started working with, um, and look, this is not a sales pitch for Huber Method. You can hire us to coach your salespeople, or you can do this yourself. We want you to get value out of this either way. But all you did was got on, you looked, listened to a bunch of recordings. Tell us what you found in those call recordings as well when you analyze this, because this is with Anil at AdRhino, um, what did you learn and how did you tweak the calls and how did you just tweak his overall strategy to basically increase closes here by 150% month over month? Yeah, so we started to, to kind of identify two or three things that were, that were possible. One, call structure was a little all over the place, but two, we needed to start to ask for the business early. And what was happening was, going back to that method, we weren't asking for the business upfront. Uh, there was no expectation that we could close that business here. And the reason why is that oftentimes we have this like, um, idea in our head that this sale will take a much longer time than it actually needs to, but we just need to start to ask for that business. So we picked up on two or three like interesting cues. When people said, I'm looking for this, that's an opportunity for us to dig in a little bit deeper and, and identify like the pitch that we can go after. We also had to figure out two or three ways to actually uh, articulate, uh, you know, kind of credibility because it was early days, right? For Ad Rhino, we didn't have a ton of customers up front, And so we need to work closer to, to establish that credibility. So he created really meaningful stories about credibility, things that he did in the past, right? That also helped people grow the revenue significantly, share those. And at the end of every conversation, we were asking for business. And you can see right here on this, on this chart, we went from zero closes per month, right? <laughs> so the week after we started working together, we saw an exponential growth in the amount of closes. I, and I think it's- uh, it, from, it, my it, point, it, from my point of view, I was talking to Anil and he's like, Nick, I think we got to hire an outside salesperson. He's like, this is not- for me, I'm doing really poorly. I don't feel confident to two weeks later saying, Hey, Nick, we just closed our third deal in a row on a one call close because like we got this thing going and his confidence hit. He started to just, I mean, look, the, 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 the uh, chart here speaks for itself. So pretty awesome stuff. Um, what else do we oh, need to do? Yeah, let's talk about the uh, just the format for coaching room uh, because I think there's a couple of questions on on format for coaching. So here's how we do it: uh, on a weekly basis, we have uh, the customer submit uh, call recordings. We want to listen to one call that went well, one call that wouldn't be bad, and then one thing that like is just interesting, something that you want to have feedback. This also starts the muscle for business owners today. Have your team send you calls, and one of the keys that I do is have them timestamp or listen to the call themselves. Don't have them just blindly send over. 
any conversation, have them actually do that. that uh, that's a good, that's a good thing. So you're saying like timestamp the part where you think, you know, you did a good job timestamp a, a section where you think could have went better. Like listen to this call yourself, self coach here, share with me. And I think even that accountability is kind of like a Fitbit, right? When you're, when you have it on your wrist, you're going to, you're going to eat a little bit. Now every week before we meet, I'm going to look at the two or three things that you think are super interesting. One, it helps me uh, reduce the amount of time necessary to look, to review those calls. But two, it helps people, it helps identify What's the right, like, what am I looking at? Or what, am, what is this person actually self-conscious about? Or what are they super confident about? And that allows us to have a much more meaningful coaching conversation. Then we review the metrics. We look at your pipeline. We're going to hold you accountable to those goals. So that accountability comes in for every play. We're going to listen to those calls. And we're only going to highlight two or three things. Coaching needs to be done in very small bite-sized snippets. If you try to coach on everything, the entire call structure, discovery, pitching, everything all at once, People, if people are going to lose interest and they're not going to know what to focus on. Instead, pick one or two things that you can get really excellent at very quickly, add value there, and then hone the message. Continue to work on that skill over and over again. So weeks three, four, five, six, we're going to keep uh, perfecting that message until it's ready. And then we can move on to the next skill. So again, we're going to ask for it's customer a, calls. It, turning, you, you told me something that was very interesting. You said turning one of your employees into a sales machine is a six to 12 month endeavor. Yeah. Like if you coach them and you work with them and you re record and review their calls, it can be group coaching. A, a year later, they're going to be insanely valuable. They're going to know it inside and out. They're going to know what works. They're going to have data on what what they say and when they say it, how that impacts the close. And look, they, we're just running plays. Like we are literally, business is just a series of plays. I say this all the time. You can run, you know, you buy, Warren Buffett said that you buy a company and you have three or four plays you can run to double the value of that company. Sales is the exact same, Okay. You can study it. You can learn the plays. You can learn what works. You can learn what doesn't. And you can have those plays in your repertoire. You try them on each lead. If you lose it, you lose it. If you win it, you win it. But you're going to win more. Well said. Love it. All right. A uh, couple more. Are we missing any of the stories that we wanted to tell? The nuts and bolts. Um, let's see if we miss any of this stuff. Guys, ask a couple questions. We got a couple minutes left. Um, let's see. What do you guys want to? What do you guys want to know from us before we close this thing down? And also, just uh, let us know if you've had if you've gotten value. Good. Joaquin's got a good one. I have a few leads I've been sitting on for two weeks. What's the best way to pick up these warm leads that came from cold callers? I was thinking of playing the car. I was devoting my time to a previous project. Joaquin, I got to tell you, do not reference prior cold call attempts, right? Failed attempts or tell people that you were too busy dedicating it to other people. Pick up the phone and say, hey, I received your inquiry. I know it was about two weeks ago. Tell me why you inquired. How can I help you? And just yeah. ask people. The, the simplest thing to do here is act. If you have a bucket of leads that you haven't been getting back to for whatever reason, pick up the phone today, send the email today, act as quickly as possible. Don't let three or four weeks to go, to go and then uh, you know all of those leads just kind of fall out. The other one too uh, that I saw that was really interesting is um, how much time do you think on, on building a distribution channel, uh, Nick? What do you think about like, how much time do you think an entrepreneur or an early stage business owner should spend on uh, building distribution like, Twitter or other things versus selling. Yeah. I mean, look, it's just, it's just another way to build trust. There's many ways that you can build trust. You can be a notable figure uh, in your community. Somebody could be in your golf group. They're going to be more likely to buy from you because you play golf with them. They get to see you every day. They could see you at church. They could read your thoughts on Twitter. They could read your thoughts on LinkedIn. Obviously it's a tremendous competitive advantage to have my distribution that I have on Twitter and on LinkedIn and, and on YouTube and, and right here, wherever. But look, I don't know. I don't know if I would recommend that everybody try to become an influencer as part of their sales channels, right? Focus on your business, build your business, grow your business, set your family up so that if you die, you're going to be fine and you're going to have the month monthly income coming in to do what you need to do. And then, okay, if you if you become an influencer in the meantime, that's just added bonus. Um, did we do a good job? Did we do a good job, guys? A answer that. Ask ask a question. Type to us. Let us know. But look, the um, you can go to HuberMethod.com and you can get on a call with Jeremiah right now or tomorrow or the next week, whenever, and he'll add value to you. He won't put pressure on you to buy. He'll tell you what we're about, and he will give you some nuggets to walk away with um, in this stuff. But let's see. Some other things we might want to talk about. Let's see the stories that we have. Yeah, I mean, I, I learned, I want to tell a very quick story here, is I was actually selling school contracts in my student storage business, meaning we wanted Emory in Atlanta to, to partner with Storage Squad and we wanted to be the recommended provider for student storage. We went into these sales meetings early on and we'd go to universities across the country and we would try to sell on price and on, and on student experience. 
hey, we're going to be the cheapest for your students and we're going to give them the best experience because we got an online app. We realized that the, the person that we were selling to didn't actually give a crap about price or anything. These were people who worked at a university that had one concern, stay out of trouble and make sure that this company is legitimate. So we started moving our entire sales pitch around the fact that we were big, that we did 7,000 students a year. Here's all of our insurance papers. We haven't had a claim in four years. We rent only the best warehouses. All of our trucks are insured. All of our people are background checked. That's all they cared about. They didn't care about how much we how much we charged. They wanted to know that they were going to be out of trouble and there was going to be no negative PR for their students. It's the one thing that they cared about in those meetings. And we whiffed on it for years going and trying to sell on price and student experience. So what I'll say, make sure you know the one thing. Make sure you know the one thing that your people that you're selling to actually care about. And sometimes it's not actually um, what you what you expect. Any other questions, yep. folks? Awesome. Oh, I wow. We got a lot of, we got a lot yeah, of we got questions. A, we got a lot of ones coming through here. Um, let's see. Yep. The, the two nuggets that, and, and list your nuggets here. If you, if you wrote down, if you took some notes, what did you take away from this? Um, Armando says his two nuggets is that knowledge turns into trust. And that's absolutely right. The more knowledgeable you can prove that you are, the more people will trust you and that you should compete on quality first, speed later, avoid competing on price. Those are two amazing nuggets that you had there. Here's an awesome question uh, from Cordell. What's the best way to get past gatekeepers on uh, decision makers? Uh, if you can't make gatekeepers your friends, call the right people. Um, but all, early and often, this goes back to that question about discovery. Every person that you speak to at the organization can give you information, right? Uh, they can help you understand that person's schedule, how they respond to things. This helps build the picture of the individuals that you want to reach out to. Uh, if you're going through a property manager to get the company owner, I would just go back to the, to the company owner rather than calling the secretary all day find the right channel that works for them, uh, but utilize relationships with people that you would consider gatekeepers and people that want to be on your side and provide you information. Uh, I'll share with you, I was trying to win one of the biggest deals of my life uh, at the time. Uh, this company had a, had a secretary that would not let me uh, ever talk to the principal. Uh, and I called her probably three or four times a week for, for about six or seven weeks. And we became really friendly. Um, and eventually, uh, she told me that he only likes to take meetings on Fridays. Uh, that's when his schedule clears up. He sits in the office for about four hours after work, uh, and he'll actually have a meeting with someone. I sent her a big, beautiful uh, edible arrangements uh, and said, hey, I really want, I, I hope Friday is my Friday. Uh, and by Thursday, I got a call back and I had a Friday appointment at 4 p.m. And I sat down in his office. We sat down for three and a half hours, connected. I spent my entire Friday afternoon not going out with my buddies but we end up closing a business deal. But sometimes it takes consistent conversations, understanding how someone works uh, and a little bit of sweetness to, to really kind of get you through. Yep. Uh, we have a bad sales pitch here in the uh, in the comments. Will O'Neill says, let's play golf. I suck, but I always wanted to play ACC. Okay, you didn't build trust. You didn't uh, talk up your golf game and you made it all about you because you've always wanted to play ACC. I would not invite somebody. I will actually invite you, uh, Will. But you just got to say things like, hey, I'm a really good conversationalist. I keep a positive attitude and I play fast golf. I'd love to drink some Miller Lights with you on the golf course. That's how you make the sale to play golf. Um, <laughs> and then one see. more tech question. Tech question. Uh, CRMs. Uh, we use a combination across six companies at Airtable and HubSpot, right? From, from a CRM perspective, can't go wrong with, with either one of those. Uh, the best kind of CRM is the one that your team uses. Um, so it's not about a, a specific tool. It's one that people use. And then for recording calls, uh, you can use Firefly, Avoma, um, or mm -hmm. Kong. You know, these are all great tools that, that you can use. Uh, AI is a really powerful thing that transcribes your calls uh, super simply. So uh, the best kind of CRM is one that everyone uses. Okay, a parting word here. Every part of your job and your life as an entrepreneur is a sales environment, okay? You're selling your employees to do what you want them to do because you can't make anybody do anything. You got to make them want to do it. You're selling your partners and joining you for businesses. You're selling your customers. You're selling your vendors. You're selling your landlord on keeping you as a tenant every time you're renegotiating your lease. Everything you do is a sales environment, even when you're buying, okay? And in life, it is the same, okay? You're selling your kids on doing what you say you need them to do to get out the door for school in the morning. You're selling your friends on the fact that you can add value to their life and that they're gonna wanna hang out with you. Everybody in this world is selfish, everybody. Everybody's doing everything because it's gonna make their life better in the long run. 
Put yourself in their shoes and sell them. Take ownership over the process. You're never going to make real money in this world if you don't embrace the fact that you need to become good at sales. You're selling your employees on coming to work for you. That's a huge one, okay? An employee wants a leader who's charismatic, who's confident, who can give them what they want in a career and in a job. You have to sell them on that, okay? And look, embrace it. it it's uncomfortable. It's not fun. I know picking up the phone sucks. You get that sinking feeling right before you walk into the office. If you're doing a you know, a medical device sales call and you're in your car and you're walking in, it's not fun. My acquisitions person, they get that feeling every time they pick up the phone to call somebody who does not want to talk to them, they get that feeling and you get rejected all the time. But look, if it costs to be the boss, I guess we got to pay. Okay. Everybody wants to be a bodybuilder, but nobody wants to pick up this heavy ass weight. It's not easy. You just got to freaking do it. If you want to build a great life, you want to make money, embrace sales, take ownership over it and get good at it. And go to hubermethod.com and hire Jeremiah and me and our team to help you build out a sales organization. Any so, parting words? Yeah, I think that um, I think that I, I've learned that sales is one of the greatest things that ever happened to my life. And the moment that you start to lean into an opportunity to to become a better seller, um, you will start to unlock a lot of things. Um, without sales, uh, it's really hard to to be a business owner, to be an entrepreneur, um, to to go out and build something meaningful for yourself. Uh, get in between, uh, you know, all those difficult conversations and and start to lean in. Um, and then we're happy to help. Um, and so any kind of questions that were not answered today, uh, if anyone else ever wants to like lean in and jam on this stuff, uh, you know, we're happy to help. Yep. And uh, Cordell called me out. He said, Nick, what's the no asshole rule? Because I mentioned that at the very beginning of this call and I didn't actually explain it. And I think life and business is very similar is that everybody should work to get to a point where they don't have to do business with assholes ever. No asshole employees, no asshole partners, no asshole customers. Okay. In the beginning, I had to do a lot of business with a lot of people because I had to. They had all the leverage. I didn't have any of it. So I had to do what they wanted me to do, even if they were assholes. As your career goes, you should be working nonstop to get all the assholes out of your life meaning you have enough leverage, you have enough cash flow, you have all your stuff in a row that you don't have to do business with anybody who is rude to you. One of my investors could say, Nick, blah, 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 and they could get all mean and mad and, and, and be unreasonable. The next day I could wire their money back to their bank account. Okay, one of my partners or employees could go hey, AWOL or haywire and start to be a jerk and boom, we could, we could dissolve the partnership. Of course, it might cost me money, but it's just the way that I've organized my life and you should do the same thing. And when you operate from that point of leverage, meaning you don't need the sale, you don't need the customer, you can fire asshole customers, you can really, really do well and your world will open up. So work to get towards that point of leverage and then everything else takes care of itself. Thanks for tuning in, guys. The recording will be sent out to the folks who um, signed up and we really appreciate it. Thanks, guys.